I am delighted to welcome Alex Azar as our luncheon keynote speaker. He's president of Lilly USA, which is the largest affiliate of the global pharmaceutical leader, Eli Lilly and company, and which this affiliate that Alex runs is, uh, represents one third of Lilly's in revenue. So he's a, a leader in the company, but I think also important to have in charge of a, such a major part of a major company, someone who understands how Washington works. So many other CEOs are sort of bewildered by the process of Washington. But Alex, from his time here in many capacities, but most recently before joining Lilly, as the number two person at the Department of Health and Human Services, which has an annual budget of $700 billion, with 66,000 employees, and as you all know, the Deputy Secretary runs the department, so Alex not only knows how to run a big private sector company, but understands the challenges of working with government. So it's really a pleasure to have him here. He is involved in so many aspects of medical research and overseeing um, biomedicines, diabetes, oncology, cardiovascular health, men's health, musculoskeletal, Alzheimer's disease, man and the managed care services of the country. So he really brings us a global perspective a very sophisticated understanding of how the Washington policy arena works and also how the business sector is trying to accommodate all that. So I would welcome Alex to talk about all opportunities to drive innovation in healthcare. Welcome, Alex. Well, Grace Murray, thank you very much. Um, and thanks for your continued leadership to support free market solutions uh, to our healthcare problems in the United States and for your work to support an innovative environment here. Uh, when I was in government, Grace Marie uh, was always an incredibly valued resource for me and others um, of advice, counsel, and ideas for us as we, as we tried to shape the healthcare environment here in the United States. It's also great to see so many friends and colleagues here. It's like a, a little reunion for me. So that's a, it's a ni nice on a personal note to be with you all today. Um, <clears throat> as, as other speakers have been discussing today, there are few more important issues in the national debate today than the future of healthcare. For all of us, this should be a very personal issue. Our lives may literally depend on America's ability to sustain an environment that advances medical innovation. As the title of this conference suggests, each of our tomorrows are indeed being built today in research laboratories and in policymaking halls of government across the country. My hope is that our future will be as bright as our past. Tomorrow literally is a day of historic leaps forward in advancing our collective societal good. On May 10th, 1775, representatives from the 13 colonies opened the Second Continental Congress, the group that eventually declared our independence. Nearly 100 years later, workers in Utah drilled the golden spike that completed the first transcontinental railroad. And certainly not as well known, but personally important to me and to the millions of people affected by disease over the last 136 years, May 10, 1876, was the founding of Eli Lilly and Company by a Union Army colonel turned pharmacist. Colonel Lilly's company, the business that I now serve as a steward, would go on to play a vital role in the production of life-saving medicines such as insulin, penicillin, polio vaccine, and innovative cancer therapies, just to name a few. Of course, Lilly is just one player in America's great history of pharmaceutical innovation. A recent New England Journal of Medicine study found that about 80 to 90 percent of medicines approved between 1990 and 2007 were derived from the biopharmaceutical industry. Certainly, we depend on government and academic research as important parts of the healthcare ecosystem. But it's entirely fair to say that our own laboratories and companies like Lilly, it is our own laboratories and companies like Lilly that will most likely produce future breakthroughs. But we have to ask, are we building a healthcare system today that will make those breakthroughs a possibility tomorrow? Today, I want to talk about three of the critical concepts that frame this debate. First, why innovation matters. Second, why we can't take American leadership for granted. And third, what we can do to better support medical innovation here in the United States. 
In my role at HHS, I often met with counterparts in health ministries from other countries, and I found that my position was rather unique. Like others, I had responsibility for financing and delivery of elements of health care. But unlike them, my portfolio also included innovation, most notably oversight of the National Institutes of Health and the Food and Drug Administration. So unlike my colleagues, I had to balance the goals of reducing cost and sustaining innovation. This broader perspective also helped me appreciate the potential for innovation to actually reduce costs, improve quality, and allay human suffering. As we struggle with the healthcare challenges of today, a narrow focus on cost to the exclusion of innovation would be self-defeating. What we need is a different perspective on the value of medical innovation and what it will take to increase that value in the years ahead, to increase our collective ROI, or our return on innovation. The fact is that medical innovation over the past century has transformed the basic expectations of human life that had prevailed since the dawn of civilization. Tens of millions of death sentences were lifted and once dread diseases became manageable chronic conditions. Take our progress against two of our leading killers. The death rate for, from coronary heart disease in the United States has declined by about two-thirds since it peaked in 1968. There are one million Americans who lived last year, one million who would have died in 2011 at the 1960s rate. And the American Cancer Society says that from 1991 to 2007, the death rate for all cancers dropped 17%. Over 100,000 more people in this country are alive every year because of this decline. The cumulative impact of medical innovation of the, over the past century is nothing short of mind-boggling. In 1900, the average life expectancy of an American was 47 years of age. In 2000, it was 78. That's an increase of 66% in one century, unprecedented in the course of human history. The industry that I represent is one of the big reasons why we've gained these extra decades. An analysis by Columbia University professor Frank Lichtenberg found that launches of new medicines accounted for 40% of the increase in life expectancy during the 1980s and 90s alone. This matches our own personal experience. We all know people in their 70s and even in their 80s who have left behind rocking chairs for sea kayaks and cross-country skis. And while we're all frustrated with the rise in overall healthcare spending, a big chunk of it is due to the fact that these folks are now healthy enough to get a knee replacement or a coronary bypass or cancer treatment in their 70s and 80s and continue their active lifestyle, which sounds a lot better to me, to be honest. If the sole impact of biopharmaceutical innovation was additional decades of life and health, we'd be hard pressed to find its equal. But the economic payback from these gains is also difficult to overstate. The payback is years of productive work economic value added, consumer spending, and tax dollars paid, which together outweigh the cost of treatment overwhelmingly, even if you resist putting a number on the intrinsic value of a human life. There's also compelling evidence that innovative medicines are the most cost-effective part of healthcare. A couple of years ago, David Snow, the former CEO of Medco, visited Lilly, and he said that it costs half as much to treat patients with diabetes who adhered to their prescribed course of medicine to those who didn't. More broadly, the use of modern medicines in the period of 1960 to 2000 helped cut in half the number of hospital admissions for 12 major diseases, including mental illness and infectious disease. Medicines are not cost drivers, they're cost savers. And last year, as many of you may know, the Journal of the American Medical Association reported that when seniors who didn't have comprehensive prescription drug coverage received coverage through the new Medicare Part D plan, they saved an average of $1,200 per year in hospital, nursing home, and other medical costs. That translates into a $12 billion per year savings across Medicare. David Snow summed it up well. He said, quote, drugs used properly are part of the solution, not part of the problem. Now, because of our track record of innovation, some take ongoing progress for granted or think that we have all the innovation that we need. But we must build upon, not rest upon, the contributions of the past. For all our tremendous progress, much, much more remains to be done. 
with 10,000 American baby boomers turning 65 every single day. It's not surprising that we've seen a sharp increase in the incidence of diseases associated with aging, cancer, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, neurodegenerative disease, and more. The Alzheimer's Association says that by 2050, absent effective treatments, more than 13 million Americans will be afflicted by that disease, and costs in the U.S. alone could surpass $1 trillion a year. Let's face it, the only way to make further inroads against these and other conditions is to sustain medical innovation. The good news is that advances in life sciences are bringing treatments once beyond our reach finally into view. One need look no further than the 36 new molecular entities approved by the FDA in 2011. But we can't stop this revolution cold in its tracks. As we know, the bar for innovative medicines is rising inexorably higher. So here's our challenge. What can we do to ensure that we sustain the innovation required to conquer diseases, control costs, and maintain the trajectory of longer, healthier lives? How do we win the case that what we do is, in David Snow's words, part of the solution? We've got to start by facing facts. We cannot take innovation for granted, nor can we take America's role in that innovation for granted. Today, the U.S. is the undisputed leader in medical advances. Our biopharmaceutical sector is the envy of the entire world. Over half a million Americans are directly employed in the biopharmaceutical industry with, with an average income of over $115,000 a year. Another 3.4 million Americans' jobs depend on the existence of the biopharmaceutical industry. U.S. inventors and companies hold the intellectual property rights to a majority of new medicines. They account for more than 80% of the world's biotech R&D, and they're testing more potential medicines in clinical trials than the rest of the world combined. This wasn't always the case. As recently as 1990, the pharmaceutical industry spent 50% more on research in Europe than in the United States. By 2001, that was reversed, with the industry spending 40% more here in the United States, and we've never looked back. But if I'm allowed to edit baseball legend Satchel Paige, it's time we did look back because something's definitely gaining on us. In fact, despite all this progress, despite all these gains, the evidence is mounting that we are facing today nothing short of an innovation crisis in America's life sciences sector. To begin with, the science is difficult, incredibly complex, and staggeringly expensive. Over the past 25 years, the cost to develop one new molecular entity has risen from $100 million to, to some $1.3 billion, in part because finding the next breakthroughs to treat stubborn diseases like diabetes, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease is among the most challenging of human endeavors. At the same time, the number of new molecular entities approved by the FDA over the past five years, 95, is lower than in any other five-year period since the 1970s. And this comes in the midst of a six-year period when products that comprise some 40% of, of the total U.S. retail pharmaceutical market lose patent protection. That's great news for consumers who are going to gain access to more generic drugs, medicines, by the way, that exist solely because of our original research, but this translates into $150 billion less annual revenue for the industry collectively, which means we'll have proportionately less to invest in discovering and developing the next generation of innovative medicines the world desperately needs. If we just take as an assumption that, the pharmace that pharmaceutical companies invest 20% of revenue in R&D, that translates into 23 new molecular entities per year that will not be brought to the patients of the world. As a result of these forces in the large cap pharma industry, we've seen a wave of defensive consolidations that's left a dwindling number of entities capable, capable of taking an idea, a discovery, and turning it into a medicine approved for patients. Large pharmaceutical companies and a select group of large biotech companies are the only entities that can do this work, period. And I believe that a further reduction of this small community is not necessarily a good thing. 
The smaller biotech firms in the U.S. have also seen their cash dry up as investors clearly see the tremendous risks with less upside than ever before. At this moment of unprecedented pressure on our homegrown biopharmaceutical companies, the rest of the world is not standing still. The U.S. is not the only country looking to the life sciences to drive economic growth. The very qualities that brought much of the world's research capacity to our shores could just as easily attract the world to Asia or elsewhere. For example, the number of global pharmaceutical patent applications that named one inventor or more located in India or China has risen fourfold since 1995. We've also been hearing for years how countries like India and China are producing more scientists and engineers than we are. Those potential innovators see improving prospects in their own countries. So now instead of coming here or staying here and contributing to our economy, many of the world's best and brightest are, as a Washington Post headline put it, taking their brains and going home. Other countries are competing ferociously for biopharmaceutical R&D and manufacturing jobs, enhancing the quality of their labor markets, empowering effective public-private technology transfer approaches, creating long-term stable tax regimes that are hospitable to innovation, and building predictable regulatory and intellectual property systems. After facing the facts, we have to ask ourselves, what will it take to preserve our lead in innovation, including medical innovation? Let me be clear, when it comes to sustaining innovation, the burden remains on research-based companies like Lilly, as it should. Businesses, businesses like ours that live or die by healthcare innovation in the U.S. ask only that we be allowed to continue doing just that, proving the value of what we've developed and succeeding or failing in the marketplace. The one thing that the industry has a right to ask of public policy, in my view, is to help preserve the environment in which innovation is even possible. When it comes to health care policy, we need to speak up for policies that sustain and encourage innovation and against those that would undermine it. The pursuit of innovation in any field is very difficult and a very high-risk venture. If innovation is to take root and grow, it requires a combination of elements that we describe as an ecosystem. That ecosystem of innovation has several important elements, including first, open access to healthcare markets with market-based pricing. Second, a regulatory system that keeps pace with 21st century science. And third, a tax policy that encourages innovation. Each of these elements is indispensable, and when we see them under attack, we need to stand our ground and call out the potential consequences. For example, we believe that doctors and patients are, must remain the ones to choose in an informed way from all available treatments. That's why we call for the repeal of the Independent Payment Advisory Board. IPAB's goal may be to slow the growth of health care spending, which we all would agree with, but an unaccountable board that focuses only on cost cutting, not on quality, not on health outcomes, has dangerous or potentially fatal consequences for patients and for biopharmaceutical R&D. My message is simple. Government actions affect prices, prices affect investment, investment affects innovation, and innovation affects health. Innovation and freedom of competition play a critical role in our healthcare economies, and misguided, albeit well-intentioned, government policies can greatly stunt its growth. As I mentioned, the tension between meeting rising costs and investing in innovations for tomorrow is one of the most intractable questions that political leaders can face. Look at Europe. Too often in trying to strike this balance, governments lean too much towards short-term savings and succumb to the temptation to control expenditures through direct price controls, cuts in reimbursement rates, delayed market access, and other subtle and not so subtle practices that either restrict the amounts paid for innovative products or reduce the consumption of innovative medicines and devices. Why does this matter? Because there's a direct relationship between these types of cost containment measures and innovation. A study by the U.S. Commerce Department evaluated cost controls in a number of industrialized countries and found that lifting cost controls could increase revenue for patented products by as much as $18 billion to $27 billion annually, something that would greatly foster innovation. That translates into as much as $5 to $8 billion of lost global R&D as a result of cost controls. Consumers are best served by free competition. Strong competition creates choices and better prices and benefits everyone and it encourages sustainable innovation. 
Contrast the European experience with our own great American experiment with Medicare Part D, the only part of our government-sponsored healthcare system that does not have the distortion of price controls. Part D has been a bigger winner than even those of us who helped launch it imagined. Costs have been as much as 40% below the original Congressional Budget Office estimates, and beneficiaries report an 85% satisfaction rate. We've got to continue speaking out against government price controls being imported into Medicare Part D. These would, in effect, constitute a new $100 billion annual tax on the biopharmaceutical industry and would have a serious and possibly disastrous consequence on many levels. For patients, the proposed price controls could put access to medicines at risk and have the unintended consequence of increasing other Medicare costs, including insurance premiums for beneficiaries. I'm likewise concerned about the harm to innovation. Add an additional $100 billion to the $150 billion in revenues we're losing due to patent expirations, and you're looking at potentially 38 new medicines per year that may never be developed at all. And that's if you assume 20% R&D investment. It could be as many as 200 if you count the full amount. Instead of looking to Part D and wanting to break what's working, we should be looking to Part D for learnings as the administration and states establish health exchanges so that we foster maximum competition. When you have a competitive health insurance market with a well-informed beneficiary in the driver's seat making choices rather than government bureaucrats, the value of the medicine and innovation is preserved. Second, and this area of policy applies mainly to my industry, we need a modernized regulatory system that is more timely, more consistent, and more predictable. The current regulatory process is asymmetrical. There's much greater pressure on regulators to identify and avoid the risks of new medicines than to balance the, those risks against potential benefits to patients. I believe the problem lies, lies not in the regulators but in the system itself, which creates incentives to put off decisions and to err on the side of avoiding risk, even if some patients might accept some risk in return for potential benefits. Regulators and the regulatory process must bring to bear a more systematic approach that documents the basis for their decisions, the data used, the rationale, the standards, and the values that the regulators applied in reaching the decision. The FDA recognizes this need as well as the need for systematic tools for benefit risk assessment. We've just got to get there. Such an approach would allow regulators to demonstrate why a decision was reasonable even when viewed in light of subsequent data. Just as important, I believe such an approach would result in regulatory decisions that are more predictable, more balanced, clearer, and more timely. Regulators in industry, and most importantly patients, have a common interest in a systematic, transparent decision-making framework to support a robust benefit risk assessment. And we have an opportunity to implement such a framework here in the U.S. in the reauthorization of PDUFA, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. This law comes up for reauthorization this year, and our industry and others have already come to a technical agreement with the FDA, which will hopefully offer a real victory for innovation and for patients. It's our hope that Congress reauthorizes PDUFA in a timely fashion and doesn't allow it to get bogged down with controversial political measures in this election year. Third, and finally, we need a tax structure that encourages rather than undermines innovation and commercialization in the United States. Specifically, we need a business tax system that levels the playing field for America's worldwide companies and enables them to compete and win in the global marketplace. Quite simply, our corporate tax rate is too high, and we should not tax the foreign earnings of U.S.-based global companies. Our country must quickly embrace a corporate tax rate in the 20 to 25 percent range, as well as a globally competitive territorial system for the taxation of foreign earnings, in other words, the same tax rates and policies that most of the rest of the developed world have already adopted. And as we move to a globally competitive tax system, we should seriously consider the temporary repatriation of foreign earnings as a transitional measure to inject cash that is currently outside the U.S. into the U.S., where it can be deployed for the benefit of American workers and used to fund other critical public needs. In addition, we've got to commit our country to a globally competitive innovation incentive tax regime. Though the U.S. was one of the first countries to offer an R&D tax credit, we have not kept pace with other nations. Other countries are making public investments to attract private capital and using tax policies to encourage local investment in R&D and related job growth. We need to make the federal R&D tax credit permanent and raise it to levels that are globally competitive 
as well as consider other tools to encourage U.S. innovation. Last, in these deficit-driven times, we must strongly resist the temptation to impose international tax re revenue raisers on America's worldwide companies. These revenue raisers will hurt the U.S. economy, deplete U.S. jobs, and further exacerbate a corporate tax system that is out of step with the rest of the world. In summary, we need a corporate tax system like the rest of the world, one that encourages rather than discourages investment in the United States. I've been talking today about America's genius for innovation and what it's meant for our citizens, more jobs, higher standards of living, and longer, healthier lives. We can't take our lead in this area for granted, and we must implement market-based solutions to foster innovation in the future. Clearly, it's impossible to predict the full range of benefits that future generations could enjoy from today's innovation. But in the field of medicine, when I think of the incredible advances of the past century, I'm convinced that what might seem unimaginable today will be commonplace tomorrow. Treatments that transform cancer into a chronic disease, with survival times measured in decades rather than months. Effective treatments for malaria, TB, and other diseases affecting tens of millions in the developing world. Breakthroughs that will save millions from the devastation of Alzheimer's disease. Cardiovascular repair and prevention of heart disease. Replacement organs. And ultimately, additional decades for people to enjoy precious life and enhanced vitality. Not just additional years, but additional healthy and productive years. And along with the profound benefits in and of themselves, we'll see exciting new opportunities, a rising standard of living and a reinvigorated American economy. However, success is not guaranteed. You'll still hear some say today that we have all the innovation that we need, or that in this difficult economic climate, we just can't afford it. I hope when you hear these arguments, you'll remember what I talked about today and conclude that innovation is not the problem. Innovation is the solution, the essential key to ensuring that when people look back to the 21st century, they'll say that it was truly the second American century. Thank you very much, and I think we may have a couple minutes for questions. Thank you, Alex. That was extraordinary in your, in your understanding of what, what it takes to get to the vision of the biomedical century that we really are on the cusp of. Thank you so much for that really wonderful talk. Um, do we have questions? Yes, we have a question back here. Tell us who you are. Can't see. Oops, we have a microphone that's not working. Try it. While we wait for the microphone, I want to tell you how much we, does it, is it working? Yes, thanks, Grace go. Marie. Uh, is that Aunt Ella? This Anthony. is Anthony Wisniewski. I'm General Counsel of Advanta Government Solutions. Uh, Alex, I'd like to know um, what your perception of the healthcare uh, management and delivery industry, how can it partner with uh, biopharma interests to uh, protect innovation in this country? Hmm. That's a good question. I think that the most important thing is we work with a lot of our partners in the payer world and employers that work to better manage, effect, especially chronic diseases, <clears throat> that as long as we're at the core of everything is if we keep the doctor and patient relationship at the center of everything and try to inform but not dictate the nature of that relationship, that's what ensures that we're going to have innovation over the long run. It's when we, it's when we try to dictate the nature of that relationship the therapies that they will select, the course of treatment that they will, that they will select, I think that's where we get into trouble. It, it, we can inform, we can educate, we can create pathways, we can create best practices. We just have to be careful that we don't go, go so far that it gets between them, uh, between the doctor and the patient in making those critical decisions because it really is, it's, it's the exit rights, it's the exit rights of individuals that whether it's competitive insurance, competitive marketplace for health care, that's what protects innovation at the end of the day, in my mind. The question? Oh, you're thinking about Can you tell I'm a recovering economist there? <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful, which is a, yet another of the important hats that you wear, Alex. And I have to, we have to give an extra thank you to Alex. He really went through heroics to get here. He got up at 5 o'clock to take a 7 a.m. flight on U.S. Airways. 
um, from Indianapolis, only to get a text message that U.S. Airways had canceled the flight and gave him no other options. He quickly so I ran. <laughs> and found that Delta had a flight at 6.15. He got to the airport at 6 o'clock. Sorry, you didn't check in in time, even though he had a ticket. So he then went over to Southwest, had had a flight at 6.20. Not only were they happy to have him on board, but they held the plane. Yep. <laughs> so does that show you what the value of competition? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And even more, the value and the determination of Alex to get here really had such an important message to share with you all. And I think it, it really is a capstone to the messages you've heard today about the importance, the crucial importance, of putting the doctor and the patient at the center of every medical decision, the vital, essential nature of competition, the crucial importance of public policies that support innovation, and the kind of, of changes and transformative changes, as Alex said, we cannot even imagine today. It is really extraordinary. So we, come on, guys. He's answered all your questions? Uh-oh, Mr. Oh, Hoff. here we go. John Hoff, we <laughs> get you. See, there are, I will tell you, there are a bunch of people out here who used to work for Alex, including John Hoff, as Deputy Assistant Secretary of HHS. Uh, Alex, when Alex says, uh-oh, I'm, I'm nervous. Um, John Hoff, Galen. Alex, you mentioned uh, that you wanted repeal of the iPad. I would just ask you um, an open-ended question. Are there any other provisions of PIPACA that you might also want to uh, have repealed in order to promote innovation? So the biggest thing, John, that we're focused on right now is, is IPAB and trying to get that removed. The unaccountable, unelected group of 15 that would make decisions literally of life or death for, uh, for so many Americans and uh, questions around, around therapies that, uh, that people should have access to. Um, our other focus going forward has to be on the implementation of, of the statute and ensuring that as exchanges are set up, as the, as the thousands of decisions that will get made in implementing the statute of that size, that those decisions get made with a framework of how do we, within that framework, support as much market-based competition as possible, uh, lesser regulatory approaches, less command and control approaches around setting up exchanges, market facilitation, information gathering. I think Part D. As I, as I mentioned in, our, in my remarks, I think Part D is an excellent example of the benefits of that kind of approach, creating genuine competition, creating enhanced beneficiary choice, driving costs down, and leading to higher customer satisfaction, patient satisfaction, and patient health care. So that's the model I would look to, and that's where I want to be advocating as we, as we work on the implementation of, of, this, of the statute. Alex, I wonder if you can talk to us a little bit about, about PDUFA, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act that um, has been making its way through Congress on a bipartisan basis and got, uh, was voted out on a bipartisan basis with a strong vote out of the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee yesterday, and it's scheduled to go to full committee on, when, on tomorrow, I believe. It's, it's been interesting to me to see a really crucially important piece of legislation that when legislators really get down to this is something we have to do, they can work on a bipartisan yeah. basis. And hopefully this will get through within the next month or so, yes? Right, it, it, it really needs to go through fairly quickly. I think October 1st is, is the date when, when the previous version of PDUFA will expire. So I know this from personal experience that you have to start, if you're running an agency and you have appropriated money and you have set amount of PDUFA fees coming in, if it's not reauthorized by a certain time, you actually have to start taking personnel actions and beginning processes to, to make modifications of your, of your practices. And FDA really requires the PDUFA system to function, to do its core job. Because it is must-pass legislation, it, it, we can't operate without it. This is where it becomes a challenge to ensure that, we, that, we, that it doesn't become a vehicle for all sorts of other controversial provisions that then could bog the legislation down from eventual passage. We want to clean PDUFA, um, keep the controversy, let's treat any, any other provisions, let's take those on separately and have debate and have that through the legislative process separately from a clean PDUFA. Yes, sir. <clears throat> we have over here. Anne. My name is Peter Boetsma. I'm the health counselor at the Netherlands Embassy. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on what kind of um, 
changes you would like to have in, uh, at FDA in, under the current uh, PDUFA regulation? Yeah. So I, it, it really is in line with what, I, with, with what I mentioned in my remarks, which is, um, and it's a difficult job. FDA the FDA regulatory system, as with all of the drug regulatory regimes around the world, they, it tends to swing a bit like a pendulum. Um, it swings between a focus on safety and a focus on benefit and access to medicine. And I think what we're seeing is that we've gotten to an asymmetrical approach now where there's an excessive focus um, it, for many, uh, many good, well-meaning reasons, a focus on safety. But it's critical that we also focus on the, the cost and the, the risk that comes from the lack of the benefit of new therapies going to patients. And that's where we think that we've gotten a bit off balance in our approaches at FDA in, in, in the last several years. And one way that we can help fix that is the idea that I mentioned of more transparent and consistent standards for reviewing new drug applications. So that the basis of decision is very clear and that it's consistent across divisions and is set there so that because anything can change. You, 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 the FDA has to approve drugs on more limited information based on phase three clinical trials. And then once it's out and tens of thousands or millions of patients are using the product, you'll learn more information about, uh, you'll learn more information about the product. Um, what's important is that those people who have to make this cost benefit decision with an FDA set forth why with the knowledge they had at the time, it was the right decision to approve a drug because there can always be second guessing later and a good transparent standards-based approach that sets that out according to a rigorous scientific pro and regulatory protocols, that's the best protection for reviewers and it's the best protection for patients. So those are the types of changes that we think are important and that would really help um, on a going forward basis with FDA. And my, my sense is that, um, that, that, there's a, that, that there's agreement at FDA uh, along similar lines. It's a matter though of, as with anything, the change management to build those into processes and make that, make that happen. It is a challenge to, uh, in this information age for the FDA to have standards, but also have enough flexibility to be able to, to recognize that, you know, sometimes there are drugs that, are, that have such a clear um, evidence that they are efficacious and safe and people need them right away to be able to have the fast track approval, but also to, um, to be able to use information so that as we get more information about a drug that can be integrated into the system as well. Exactly. I mean, there are lots of challenges in this information age to the FDA approval process. Yes, microphone right behind you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Wayne Balls with the Balls Company. Um, in thinking about the FDA, would it help speed up approval of drug, uh, new drugs on the market if you were to take the food out of the FDA, put it with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, have them do that, then the caseload, then the, then the remaining caseload might be lighter and might speed up the approval of drugs from your company and others. So let me first just make clear, I, as a company, Lilly doesn't have views on that question, but just from my own personal experience, having you know, led, led uh, FDA, I don't believe that, that it creates distraction. It's separate, it's separate centers, separate work, separate personnel, uh, separate processes. So I, I actually, I don't believe that, that the food regulatory jurisdiction of FDA impacts the, the device or drug work that FDA does there. Um, so I'm, I'm personal, that's just me personally. I, I don't think that's part of the solution for how we rebalance things and drive faster, faster, more predictable approvals through FDA. Just my view. Well, I want you to um, please join me okay. in thanking Alex for his heroics in getting here for a fabulous presentation. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us. It has just really been a pleasure to have each one of you here. I hope you will continue to, anything that you may have missed if you didn't get here at the beginning of the day, all of this, uh, the, the webcast is available, will soon be available at galen.org. All, all of the presentations, please follow us on Twitter and Facebook and get our regular updates so we can continue this conversation about patient-centered health reform. 
that is driven by competition, market based pricing, and consumer, consumer choice. We thank you so much for joining us for today's presentation, and thanks again to Jamie Burke, Tara Persico, and Ann Fitzgerald for making this happen. Thank you. <laughs>